And before I begin, uh, again, some general housekeeping, please note that this webinar will be recorded and we ask that you keep your videos and your microphones off during the various presentations, at least until the Q&A session at the end. The chat function, however, is open and I would encourage you to use the chat to write down any questions or comments throughout the webinar. We'll try to respond in the chat or at the end if we have time, we'll try to answer them directly. And of course, there are emoji reactions. If you want to use those as well, feel free. So I'll begin. During this webinar, I will be introducing you to a brief history of Freshwater Watch during these past 10 years. My name is Caroline Pila. I am a freshwater science coordinator in this program based in Oxford. And then Heather Morehouse, our research lead, will kick off by demonstrating how Freshwater Watch is addressing sewage pollution in the even load catchment. Now, don't worry, it's nothing graphic or unpleasant. In fact, it's a, it's a lovely tale about partnership to improve rivers in Oxfordshire. After that, Alina Kuhlman, a science coordinator based in the Netherlands, will introduce us to the world of cows and show us how Freshwater Watch is being used for sustainable agriculture. And finally, our senior research, lead, uh, re senior research lead, Stephen Lozell, will take us to various parts of Africa and show us how Freshwater Watch is used to monitor sustainable development goals. And lastly, I'll finish off with um, questions and answers and an open floor. A word about ourselves. Who are we? We are all from Earthwatch Europe, which is an environmental charity with science at its heart, as well as an independent research organization. We're developing the discipline of citizen science. Our vision is to create a world where we work together within our means and in balance with nature. So we use a blend of science and engagement to deliver experiences that educate and produce impactful results to halt environmental decline. We engage for the public to undertake citizen science, which I'll describe in just a minute, in order to answer important environmental questions and to influence policy. Throughout the webinar, you'll be able to see how Earthwatch's Freshwater Watch program touches on our various areas of influence, touches on citizen science, community engagement, outdoor education, policy making, business transformation, all of those things at one point or another. So why do we do this? Why do we care? The context is that our planet is undergoing an environmental crisis at the moment and freshwater habitats in particular are struggling with either too much water, too little water or dirty water. Things like floods, droughts, saltwater intrusion and pollution, all of those pressures are causing problems for biodiversity, for water security and ultimately for people to enjoy a dignified life. So that's why we care. And what are we doing about this? We are keen to support citizen science, which is defined here by National Geographic. Citizen science is an open and inclusive way of producing scientific knowledge in collaboration with members of the public who are not necessarily scientists. The principles of citizen science enable people to collect useful data, to share their knowledge and to contribute to data monitoring schemes. Why does citizen science matter and how can it help our environmental crisis? Well, we know so much about our changing planet and its challenges, not just thanks to long-term scientific monitoring, but also thanks to local knowledge. The records and observations that we have on species and on weather have, for centuries, they have been collected by citizen scientists around the world to build a picture of our planet as it was then and as it is now. So this vital information is really important to mitigate environmental challenges. We've also seen what the power of citizen science can do. The power of citizens like Greta Thunberg, for instance, a schoolgirl from Sweden who ignited a huge global youth climate activist movement. She shows that there is power in raising our voices. So Greta states that when I'm taking action, I don't feel like I'm helpless. I don't feel like things are hopeless because I feel like I'm doing everything I can. One such example of citizen science 
And the one that we are celebrating today through the 10 years of Freshwater Watch is this here. It started in 2012 when HSBC, the global banking group, wanted to engage its employees with local environments and with scientists. So the Freshwater Watch method was created by Stephen Lozell and my predecessors and rolled out across the globe. Since then, the programme has reached over 100 communities, whether this is um, in corporate settings or in schools, universities, cities, villages, everything in between. What are these communities doing? What is Freshwater Watch? Well, basically, Freshwater Watch is a survey that asks you to make a series of observations about a water body, wherever you are. The questions relate to your location, to its surroundings, such as nearby land use and signs of pollution. The survey then asks you to look at the presence of plants and animals near you, and you'll be asked descriptive questions about the water body. Is it a river? Is it a lake? Does it look deep? How wide is the channel? Is the water moving fast? What colour is the water? These are simple questions, but really amount to a robust and holistic analysis of your water body. And then with a low cost and a simple fresh water watch kit, you can measure water chemistry. So the kit includes phosphate and nitrate testing tubes, which is where you take a sample of water and in these tubes, the water will change color depending on the concentration of nutrients in the water, thanks to a chemical reaction. So in the, in the image on the top right, you can see that a water sample has turned pink and with the color chart behind it, you would be able to read that there is just under 0 0.5 milligrams of phosphate per liter of water um, in, in your uh, yeah, per liter of river water. Some of you may be familiar with this method because it's the same as what food inspectors use to check food standards. And last but not least, we also have a, a secchi tube, which is a cylinder that you can see um, to measure turbidity of water. In other words, the cloudiness to reflect how many sediments or particles are being carried along the river. Those are the two bits of kit uh, in a freshwater watch kit. Since 2015, citizen scientists along the River Thames, in 2015, they took part in the first Water Blitz, which is an event that quickly became one of the highlights of the Freshwater Watch program. A Water Blitz takes place over one weekend, during which citizen scientists, so anyone, a member of the public, um, collects water samples and gathers a broad snapshot of water quality in a, a large given area. So this data set, that they collect becomes extremely valuable because it covers a broad area in a short amount of time, gathering more data than a typical scientist would be able to collect themselves. After the success of the Thames Blitz in 2015, we've had water blitzes in Bristol, in Dublin, Paris, Luxembourg. We've had some in Sweden, Italy, Netherlands, and it's been so much fun, as you can see from the images of happy citizen scientists here. These events are fun opportunities to initiate people to simple and easy environmental monitoring methods and to spend some quality time outdoors and by the river. We are a unique program in that we support local communities to address local issues. And due to our global reach, we can compare local to global patterns in freshwater. We have had over 100 research projects now and counting, and all the data is open source, meaning it's free and accessible to everyone. So now after 10 years of fun, we have 32,000 freshwater watch measurements. We've engaged with over 15,000 citizen scientists. We have currently 64 active community groups working in over 32 countries, and we've monitored 1,200 different water bodies and published all of our findings in scientific publications to demonstrate how this data is contributing to freshwater research and to social science. Tonight, I would like to share three of our current freshwater projects from global um, community groups in the UK, in the Netherlands and in Africa. These projects all use Freshwater Watch in different locations, different settings, and with very different challenges, but they all showcase the value of people-powered science. In this line of work, 
Uh, people Powered Science needs people behind the science, and we are so thankful to the thousands of volunteers who have taken part in Freshwater Watch over the years. But special thanks again to our, our science team predecessors, Izzy Bishop, Ian Thornhill, and all those who have come before. And we look forward to the next 10 years, what those might hold. So that concludes my brief introduction of the Freshwater Watch um, programme so far. And now I'd like to introduce Heather, Heather Morehouse to teach, tell us about sewage in the Evenload and tales of partnership over there. Thank you, Caroline. Um, so tonight I want to talk to you a little bit about the work of our Freshwater Watch uh, scientists in the Evenload UK and how they have been addressing the issue of sewage in our rivers. Next slide, please, Karen. So only 14% of our rivers in the UK are achieving good ecological status under the Water Framework Directive. And why is this? Well, many people are, are pointing the finger at sewage treatment works who are releasing treated and untreated sewage effluent into water bodies and um, releasing nutrients such as phosphates, which is causing nutrient enrichment that leads to algal blooms, uh, loss of oxygen for organisms such as fish. And we have seen a huge explosion in the media and public awareness of this issue. And as such, um, there has been an increasing demand for action from the water companies themselves. But there's also been this increase in awareness that we need water quality data to evidence what is going on in our rivers. And thanks to the work of Freshwater Watch, sadly, we've seen that this issue of sewage is not restricted to the UK. And indeed, within the UK itself, the rural catchment of the Evenload in Oxfordshire is also no different. And here we can see one of our fabulous citizen scientists, Anne Miller, as she collects a water quality sample from the murky depths of the Evenload. So where is the even load and what kind of drove the impetus for this work? Well, the even load is um, it spans Gloucestershire and Oxfordshire. It is a catchment that is formed of many rivers and tributaries that feed into the even load. Its source is in Gloucestershire. It flows through the Cotswolds area of outstanding natural beauty through Oxfordshire and it ends up in the River Thames. And the Environment Agency found that out of the 18 water bodies or subcatchments in the Evenland catchment, none of these water bodies achieved good ecological or chemical status. And the models that they used found that 65% of phosphate that was entering the waters was coming from sewage treatment works, of which there are 19 in the catchment. And this kind of deteriorating water quality kind of drove the formation of the Evenload Catchment Partnership. This is a partnership that is hosted by Wild Oxfordshire and interestingly is funded by Thames Water under their Smarter Water Catchment Initiatives. And it's a very unique partnership because it has so many multiple stakeholders involved, ranging from water companies, environment agency, local NGOs, including Earthwatch, um, as well as local community groups and community members. And it is the work of these community groups that are very much at the forefront and the work that they are doing is being used to kind of drive our understanding and campaign for action to improve the health of the even load here. Next slide, please, Caroline. Again, another thing that makes this catchment partnership so unique is that citizen scientists are now taking more monitoring uh, measurements, 
than the Environment Agency. And in the lighter blue, we can see that from the 1970s, the EA were taking samples and this kind of peaked in the 1990s. Um, following funding cuts, we've seen a steady decline in this regulatory monitoring. And the dark blue kind of peak at about 2015 shows this increase in fresh water watch samples been taken thanks to the Thames Water Blitz event. But now we have more uh, citizen scientists taking regular monthly monitoring in the catchment. And this is giving us a really nice picture of seasonal uh, changes. It's also monitoring more sampling sites um, than the agency. Um, and this is very much complementing and building on the long-term monitoring that the agency um, have been conducting. And tonight I'd like to uh, showcase um, some of our findings from one uh, tributary within the Evenload catchment, Little Stock Brook. One of our great citizen scientists, John Pratt, has been monitoring this particular area for about three years now. And you can see the upstream of the Milton under Witchwood sewage treatment work, we have lower phosphate results. This is shown by the lighter uh, dots um, showing lower phosphate values here. Whereas downstream of the sewage treatment works, we're seeing darker colours indicating higher phosphate values. And again, this is reflected in the graph as well. And the Evenload, um, again, the citizen scientists kind of came up with this hypothesis and approach through measuring upstream and downstream. It would really help to pinpoint and understand the impact of sewage treatment works, because again, a lot of regulatory monitoring is only either in one place in a river or downstream of a sewage treatment work. But here we're really seeing this value of this upstream and downstream monitoring approach. And this incredible uh, data has been fed into a water quality report and infograph, uh, which summarizes that report pictured here. We also um, have found um, kind of seasonal uh, differences, so increases in phosphates in summer months that is perhaps indicating the influence of continuous uh, sewage emissions. Um, and we also have looked or undertaken preliminary investigations into diffuse or wider spread um, pollution, such as from agriculture or septic tanks or private discharges in this catchment, which is much more um, difficult to detect. And, and understand here. Next slide, please, Caroline. And so our work continues um, with our citizen scientists um, continuing to undertake their monitoring. We're also training more uh, citizen scientists who are going to be monitoring sites where there is a, a lack or complete absence of monitoring in the catchment. We've also deployed four automated uh, sensors um, that are measuring water quality at 15 minute intervals. They're measuring um, a, a wide variety of parameters um, and we've placed them upstream and downstream of two sewage treatment works, again, to understand uh, these dynamics a bit more and in more detail, and hopefully it will pick up um, events, weather events, spill events that sometimes can be missed by in-person sampling. And you can find all this information out, uh, including accessing the reports from the Wild Oxfordshire website, plus other um, details about what's going on in the partnership. You could also watch our YouTube uh, webinar, our first year as a smarter water catchment, um, where our groups who are working on biodiversity, um, sustainable agriculture and natural flood management uh, also talk about their incredible work as well. And with that, I'd like to say thank you.
and I'll help uh, answer any questions in the chat. Thank you. Thank you, Heather. Now I'd like to introduce Aline Kuhlman, who is a science coordinator in the Netherlands, to talk about how Freshwater Watch arrived in the Netherlands. Thank you for your introduction, Caroline. Um, so I am Elina, I am Dutch, I am living in the Netherlands, um, and I will tell you something about our Freshwater Watch projects here that are focusing on farmers. Um, but first, let me introduce you to some of our pioneer farmers all over the world. Um, we're going to start with a cattle farmer uh, in Ireland. He's been monitoring the streams across his fields for about two years now, um, and he's found some very interesting results. Um, in this graph, you can see the phosphate concentrations that he's been measuring on his farm. Um, and you can see a spike. And this spike is um, actually caused by the farmer surrounding him because he did not apply any fertilizer or slurry to his field at this time. But this is the day before the slurry deadline in Ireland. Um, and that deadline is in place to avoid nutrient leaching. But as you can see in this graph, it actually causes a nutrient spike. And this is a very clear example of where practice and policy contradict each other um, that we would probably not have known about without a citizen science farmer um, in our battalion. Um, we've also had an uh, experiment in the UK with farmers who have sloped fields, and they were dealing with severe soil erosion um, and therefore nutrient loss as well. And they were experimenting with coppice bundles um, to see if that those bundles could prevent um, uh, eroding soil to enter their surface water um, and to try and prevent nutrient leaching, um, especially in the winter months uh, when their fields might be barren. Um, and then we fly all the way to the other side of the world, to China, where we're running experiments with stevia farmers. Stevia is a, a sweetener. Um, and again, these farmers are struggling with nutrient leaching into surface water, causing algal blooms. Um, it's a severe problem, and they're currently doing experiments with different types of fertilizers, um, using fresh water watch to monitor nutrient concentrations to figure out what the best way is to, uh, to grow their crop without polluting their environment. Um, here in the Netherlands, we're focusing on farmers as well, um, and more specifically due to the nitrogen deposition crisis that the Netherlands is facing right now. Um, a big part of that nitrogen um, is due to our agricultural industry, which is putting farmers under enormous pressure um, to make a quick transition to more sustainable way of agriculture. Um, and hopefully we can support them in that transition. Um, so what we're doing is we're via experiments trying to find out if we can use Freshwater Watch um, for KPI validation. KPIs are critical performance indicators, um, and these are indicators for ecosystem health uh, in both biodiversity, water, um, but also soil health. Um, and by so if farmers can collect their own data on their own farms about their own impact, um, we can create a data-driven information system via which farmers can see for themselves what their impact is, change their land management accordingly. Um, so it's it's an evidence-based system on data that they can collect for themselves. Um, so again, we're trying to support farmers, um, but we're also trying to engage, teach and listen, and most of all, learn from each other. Um, we're not here to teach farmers, but we are but we're also there to learn from farmers and come to solutions together. 
Um, I've spoken a little bit about soil as well. It's what makes the projects in the Netherlands unique um, for Airport so far. We're trying to find a connection between soil and water. Um, they both influence each other um, via soil erosion, flooding or drought. Um, nutrient leaching is a very, very big problem um, and we need a good soil, but also clean water um, to support the biodiversity that we need. And you can imagine if your agricultural system looks like this for the most, most part, finding out the dynamics between soil and water is a very, very important part of the transition to sustainable agriculture. So how are we actually measuring soil health? Um, we've developed a new science, citizen science toolkit and just like Freshwater Watch, it is cheap and easy to use. Um, most of the tools needed a farmer will have in his shed. Um, and we're looking at five different parameters here. So we're starting with soil type, which is not something a farmer can change but it is on the basis of how your soil will react to circumstances. Um, next, we're looking at infiltration rate of the soil, um, which is how fast water can penetrate the soil. So this is important in both dry areas or you might lose water too fast or in areas prone to flooding where water might sit on your soil for way too long. Um, then we have soil color, which is a proxy for organic matter in your soil. Um, organic matter says something um, about um, indirectly about nutrient availability, but also how much moisture a soil can hold, which is important for your crop. Um, then we're looking at earthworms. Um, they're very recognizable, easy to count. Um, and very, very important for your soil because they, they make sure that oxygen can penetrate the soil, but they also um, um, transform that organic matter to nutrients that your crop can use. Um, and then lastly, we uh, monitor vegetation cover, which is especially important in areas that are prone to soil erosion um, because the roots of a crop um, will hold the soil in place. And all of this theoretical work, um, we, we can't support farmers from behind our desk. Um, so all of this, the this the theoretical work has led to an amazingly fun fieldwork season um, where we've gone out to the farmers to see situations in the field for ourselves so that we can help farmers set up monitoring schemes. Where do they need to monitor? What are the good spots to take measurements on your soil or on your water and when? Um, we've done trainings with um, students who are helping the farmers. We've also trained farmers themselves. But most importantly and most vital to our work that we're doing here is talking to the farmers and listening to their story um, and connecting with them. And so far we visited over 50 farms here in the Netherlands. Um, and the, the data from those visits is still being analyzed. Um, but what we do know is that Freshwater Watch is helping us to address local issues in their local context with the local stakeholders involved. Um, nutrients and, and transition to sustainable agriculture is a hot topic here in the Netherlands. Um, we don't have all the answers yet, but we hope to find out together with the farmers and students, share new perspectives, um, and hopefully find the answers to the problems. Um, with many thanks to our partners here in the Netherlands, and thank you for coming to our webinar. I'll hand over to Stephen. Lovely, thank you, Alina. I'd like to introduce Stephen Lozell now, our senior research lead, to speak to us about our work in Africa. Um, so hello, everyone. Um, it would be nice if we could do this uh, in person, but that's not possible. But uh, nice to see everyone's names there. Um, so as, as you 
probably have gathered freshwater watches stretched out across the globe to the essentially no place except Antarctica where there's no citizens who we haven't been. <clears throat> and that includes a uh, great, speaking to Pablo, who wrote a message, great work in Latin America, um, Brazil, Argentina, Mexico, um, and great work in Asia, as uh, Lee mentioned. Lee had mentioned we're doing some we're working with Chinese farmers. We're also working with Chinese um, NGOs that are trying to preserve wetlands. Some very positive uh, work. But today we're going to concentrate on a few projects um, in Africa that I hope that I think will be interesting to you. So, so we're, we're working across Africa in projects from Nigeria to Sierra Leone down to uh, um, Tanzania, Zambia, and these projects have often very different objectives, but they're, they're tied to engaging communities, very similarly to what, what we're, Heather was speaking about in the even though, um, engaging communities and giving them the power of gathering information, gathering knowledge, and working with decision makers, which are often ministries, uh, NGOs, and uh, water agencies. So we're going to look at a couple of these in detail. Um, and again, if you want to look at any of this information, you can go on the web page, go on the map, everything, uh, as, as Carolyn mentioned, is open source, so you can, you can look at individual altogether. But one of the projects that we're working with, together with the United Nations uh, Environment Program, through GEMS Water, is the relationship between citizen monitoring and, uh, and sustainable development goals, in particular Sustainable Development Goal 6, related to Indicator 632. So every country in the and the world has uh, agreed to focus on the sustainable development goals. Every country should be reporting the quality of their surface waters um, every two or three years um, to UN GEMS, so, so GEMS Water, which collects this information and then uses this information to provide advice and to, to help these countries go towards a more uh, a better um, situation with their aquatic environment, freshwater environments. Some countries have lots of information um, and report it. Um, some countries in the northern hemisphere have lots of information and don't report it, but some countries don't have a whole lot of information on what happens in their catchments. And one of those countries is Sierra Leone, where they have some absolutely brilliant people at the water, um, water management agency, but they don't have enough funds or, or people in a very extended manner who can go out and monitor the quality of the major rivers. So one of the, the major river in, in Sierra Leone is the Rocco River. And the Rocco River has some monitoring sites, but doesn't have enough. So together with the agency, um, we created uh, a series of uh, objectives of places where we wanted to monitor. And the agency went out and went to all different villages along the Rocco River and kind of and recruited and identified where appropriate monitoring sites would be and engaged the local population to see what they thought of monitoring, how they felt uh, being uh, tasked with helping the agency monitoring. With the idea of all this monitored, all this information that would be gathered will help the agency monitor uh, certainly the Raquel River, but also help the agency identify where there are problems and where policies should be made to improve uh, reduced impacts of land use. 24 communities were, were chosen to monitor 27 different sites from the very tip of the well, not from the very tip, we're extending that now to the very tip of the Rockle, but we covered mo we've covered, we're covering most of the Rockle from, from the last six months or so. These citizen scientists were invited to a, a training uh, meeting, which was extremely successful, very, very engaged people. Caroline, if you go to the next slide, just to see, you know, what are the motivations of you know, why would uh, a person agree to be a citizen scientist? And as you can see, most of the people in these villages, or most of these citizen scientists who join, are really tied to what happens in their river, where they, they use their rivers for multiple uses, and and when the quality of that river is water quality of that river is no longer appropriate, they have a real problem. So the joining signing on to be citizen scientists for multiple reasons. And and most of them have a perception of the river as as not in great shape. Comparatively, looking at, at the data that they've gathered, the Rockwell River is is not in bad shape compared to the, most of the rivers we looked at. But um but it is it does have some problem areas. 
So again, if you want to go see what the data looks like, it's all online. Um, but these are uh, the monitoring areas that the citizen scientists from these 24 communities are monitoring. And they've come up with some brilliant results, some really good information. And that information is now being used by the agency and by the ministries in or will be used in the next reporting cycle um, for the sustainable de development goals. So from citizen science in a village that has no electricity and, and logistic problems, that information is going from the, the citizen to the agency and to the United Nations, where it's going to be used to uh, to better understand what can be done to help Sierra Leone's uh, water, uh, freshwater uh, situation. As an example, the success of this is now being used across other places in Africa. So one of the places um, where we've been working for a while now is in the Kafui Basin in Zambia. The Kafui Basin is an area that has growing agricultural activities. There is some mining in the upper Kafui, but the success of the Rockle River Sierra Leone project has pushed the Ministry of, of Water in, um, in Zambia to really buy into the citizen science and, and through funding from, again, the United Nations Environment Program, GEMS, we're now taking the, the, the Rockle River model and trying it in different countries. And one of the countries that we're trying it is Zambia. So now we're going to extend monitoring beyond the uh, 15 or so communities um, in um, in the in the lower Kafui to the, the Zambezi and the upper Kafui. And this is now happening as we speak. Uh, we're working very closely with WWF and they're extending this throughout, as you can see, that this is the whole country. Um, we're going to be covering half the country uh, with monitoring. And this is done completely together with WARMA, which is the Water Management Associate, a water management agency. So again, information from citizens from the very farthest reaches of, of Zambia will be going to, to WARMA, going to WWF, used to identify where there are problems, where manage, management interventions need to be made, where land, land use policy needs to be modified. And going from that, being combined with, with WARMA data, being combined with ministry data, and then used for reporting to the United Nations. Another country that we're, where we're just in, uh, just working now to, um, to set up is Tanzania. So in Tanzania, we're working along a major river where international attention has been focused for more than a decade, and that's the Mara River. So the Mara River is a transnational river that, lead, that comes from Kenya, goes down into uh, Tanzania, and ends up in Lake Victoria, one of the biggest lakes in the world and has a, has a history of problems with eutrophication, with, with limited management, and there are not enough monitoring points done by the ministry there. So together with the ministry, um, we're identifying communities, we're identifying in, in each one of these countries, how water is managed is, is slightly different. Interesting, in Tanzania, they've created water user associations, which are groups of people who have the, the resource, their livelihood is tied to water, and those are the people who are going to be involved uh, in this project, which will be which will be rolling out in the next few weeks. So, really powerful uh, experiences here, and we're also working, which I haven't put a, I had, I didn't uh, put there, but we're also working in Malawi in two places in Malawi, again on major rivers and and major basins. One of the projects that has been going on for a while, three years now, is along the world's longest lake. So along uh, Lake Tanganyika, again, in Tanzania, um, five communities have been monitoring since 2019 um, with more than 100 citizen scientists trained. They're monitoring five locations uh, and five villages and villages um, with you know, from a couple thousand to, to four or five thousand, um, where in this project, um, We've been monitoring coastal conditions of Lake Tanganyika. So this lake is is, is 700 kilometers long, so massive, beyond comprehension. Um, but the coastal areas have some serious problems, and these problems reflect also on the resources, the livelihoods, and the health of the people who live there. So through monitoring, through some modeling, um, we're able to identify when conditions of the coastal coastal water, coastal uh, lake environment are hazardous to the people who, who regularly use that. So when coliform concentrations go up, go too high, and, and when nutrient concentrations cause algal blooms type of thing. So um, working with Tafiri, which is the, uh, the research agency of the, uh, 
of Tanzania, we were able to come up with a series of models that can now help the local communities identify through very simple measurements, as Carolyn was showing, very simple measurements, optical measurements using a Seiki tube, when conditions of the, the lake shore are problematic and when, therefore, people should not be using that water or preferably not entering into the water. And when that, what causes that we're looking into, and, and it seems to be very seasonal related, also see also what a lot of the impacts are caused by the actual communities that live on the lake. So there's a, uh, a continuous learning process, and we're mostly we're learning from them, but there's a continuous learning process that has been very impactful. So through a, a recent grant, a Schulman Award, we're now extending that from five communities to another three, extending uh, the reach of this project across across the lake and what we're going to what we're trying to do the long-term goal is this is a transnational lake with with burundi with congo with, um what we'd like to do is set up programs across the lake so that we can get communities involved everywhere um of course that will require a uh, little bit of funding and a lot of effort but um it would be something very important to allow these communities to understand what's happening to the resource resource on which they depend and how that can help the government and the ministries improve their land use management and everything else. So I think that's my last slide, Carolyn. Yeah. Good. OK. Thank you, Stephen. Pass over to you, Carol. Thank you. I would just like to close off. Having heard from the Evenload and from Netherlands and from the work in various parts of Africa, I'd like to talk about how we measure the impact Earthwatch has just finished working on a MIX platform, which stands for measuring the impact of citizen science. And it's a new way of measuring the impact of various citizen science projects. And at the moment, I'm very proud to say that Freshwater Watch has the highest impact score of the 20 um, projects on the MIX platform. But I'd like to talk about why that is. And um, it's because we look at impact in five different categories. And most citizen science projects only look at two of those five, the five being society, environment, governance, um, economy, and science and technology. So it makes sense that Freshwater Watch projects all score a high impact score in all those categories because in terms of society, we've talked about the importance of engaging with communities and in terms of the environment, there is clearly an intrinsic focus in improving water quality around different water bodies. In terms of governance, you can see that we've been working on um, working to influence management decisions in Thames Water, or we've been working on policy with the Sustainable Development Goals and various environmental water agencies. And then in terms of science and technology, we've, we've been developing this new method for freshwater monitoring, and we've produced a volume of data and publications. So economics is the one that we've scored least on, I would say, because there's no intrinsic motivation to, to have an environment an economic impact. But certainly we've been working in all, all those spheres, which is wonderful to see. And you can visit the, the MIX tool to find out more about that. Um, I won't go into more detail now. However, if you do want to um, get excited and see how you can be part of that impact, um, we regularly have events happening. And uh, because Heather mentioned the even load, there is an even load water blitz happening in just two weeks um, from the 30th of September to the 3rd of October. So anyone who lives nearby can, can sign up and join this water blitz event. And um, there are water blitz events happening elsewhere as well. So maybe you might want to become a, a catchment scientist wherever you are, or you might be inspired to set up your uh, global community group and uh, join our global network. And if so, we've just put our, our contact details here to get in touch or to, to visit our website. And we love hearing stories from, from everyone wherever they are. On that note, thank you for listening. And I will now open the floor to questions and answers. And thank you all for your attention. Thank you to our speakers. And it's been my pleasure to host this. Are there any questions in the chat or any comments that anyone would like to raise at this point? I see the chat has been active. Sorry, I haven't been monitoring it. Most questions have been answered in the chat, Caroline, but um, I suppose people can be free to go if they want to ask us any questions, stay behind.
Oh, we have one question from Alistair about how to access our open source data. I think this should be, um, I'll direct you, I'll put a note in for our website, Alistair, that you can follow. Yes, freshwaterwatch.org and through that page you should be able to see a tab called explore our data and there is um, there is our public data over there. I have a quick question if I may. Um, are there any indications of how these various nutrients, phosphates and nitrates, that are measured, how they relate to, how their levels relate to other aspects of biodiversity, um, such as river fly. There's a river fly citizen science project as well, which I, I do once a month or I'm supposed to. Um, yeah, I mean, how, how, is there any work going on relating these, uh, you know, nutrient contents to, uh, to other biodiversity values? That's an excellent question, um, and yes, we're working closely with Riverfly, um, and we have been working with them over the last year or two. Uh, the, the, the early implications are yes, where you have an ongoing uh, or extended periods of high concentrations of phosphate uh, or nitrate, you have you can see impacts on the on the on all the invertebrates, all the, the yeah, yeah. little little bugs that the, the yeah. Riverfly from. So yes. Yeah, uh, so there's a clear indication. There's also impacts on the vegetation. So we're, uh, yeah, uh, Ian Thornhill um, looked at that a few years ago using Freshwater Watch data, and where you have the impact of high qu quantities of sediment or high uh, or algal blooms or um, elevated nutrients has definite impacts on what the community is, the vegetation community. And the problem with this is these impacts don't go away the day you turn off the, the nutrient or sediment spigot, let's say. It takes uh, quite a long time for it to come back. So um, what we're seeing across the globe is where the conditions have been um, compromised for several years, even in the best of conditions when they put in mitigation efforts, the vegetation is going to take a while to come back. Not you know, it, it, it'll completely be dependent on what the conditions were, how, how far you went down the, the degradation route, but it's not, an, it's not an instantaneous return. Sometimes you even have to go to conditions that were better than they were before. So, um, but the vegetation, uh, we also have uh, Bruna on the call, who's a vegetation, river vegetation expert, and, and she, um, but she's also seeing similar things in Italy. So, uh, where you have, where you cause degradation over extended period of time, the biodiversity suffers. But luckily, these measurements come together, so they're complementary. So putting your riverfly data together with, if you happen to be a freshwater watch uh, participant, putting those together, you get an, you get a, a multi, multiple improvement on the information gained. So, um, and again, as working with citizen scientists across the globe, the folks in the even loads, the citizen science and the even load have set, a, set the bar very high because they're not just monitoring one place. So they're monitoring based on their hypothesis and seeing where active pollution sources are. So it's spot monitoring, but it's it's incredibly Thank powerful you. stuff. So. Thank you. Excellent question, by the way. Thanks. I'm good at that. Good yeah. question. <laughs> I see that Ian has his hand up. Uh oh, that's a problem. OK, I'll leave it with you. <laughs> um, thanks, everyone, for the talks. Really uh, good to, to, to see. Um, firstly, just I was going to say the vegetation thing we in some of the research was kind of reciprocal, isn't it? Because sometimes it's uh, if you've got the presence of um, some vegetation that's maybe riparian or along the edges, then actually that's having a that could be having a benefit on uh, and a mitigating effect upon the water quality rather than being impacted by it. Whereas if it was to do with the invertebrates, it's probably just going to go in one direction. Um, but um, I was just going to ask Stephen on a on a, on a lake or, or anyone um, on a lake the size of Lake Tanganyika. Uh, the first question were these colony forming forming units of concern at any point and then where do you, how, 
what role can realistically citizen science and the, the method you've got how, how can you even begin to try to find sources on a lake of that size what what, what do you do good question ian you get an a plus for today very good um so a lake that size is really well monitored using satellite data so we're monitored together you know, with with colleagues um, in, in that participate also in some of the projects we're doing there's a regular monitoring using satellite data what happens on that lake the lake is as i said 700 kilometers long and in some and up to 200 kilometers wide at some point um but Satellites don't work on the coastal areas, and it's the coastal areas where people fish, where people use the water, where people wash, where people, and the coastal areas are heavily impacted by what happens along the coast. And that, and so having information that the, the dynamics of what happens on the coast is very different than what the dynamics that happen that happen within the lake. The lake has incredibly strong hydrodynamic uh, variation throughout the year, where the it's, a, it's actually a kind of an internal wave that pushes water to the north and then pushes water to the south that drives the whole um, uh, primary production of the lake. But along the coast, the condition is completely different because you have people sometimes with limited uh, wastewater treatment or zero wastewater treatment um, that during the rainy season, lots of stuff runs down into the lake, into the coastal area. It eventually finds its way into this is also one of the deepest lakes in the world. So we're talking a kilometer and a half deep. The impact of the coast won't, you know, whatever happens in the coast will have an impact, but over a, a long period of time, but it has a direct impact on the people who actually live there. So by them monitoring what happens and associating that to uh, rain events, rainy season, associating, associating that to what happens on uh, some of the major rivers that dump water directly onto the coast, we're able to complement the satellite data and show what's happening in areas of the satellite satellite imagery doesn't really work that well on the coast because the water's shallow. It's a very relatively transparent lake. And the coast also, you know, you know, coast also you lose some definition because you have the coast. It's not you know, just looking still at the water. So it's very complementary. So the nice part about citizen science and all these projects, it's not a standalone. It's something that complements mon regulatory monitoring, satellite data, and everything else. So um we're really proving how these things can work together. Thank you very much. Um, to add to that as well, um, Ian, uh, like Stephen mentioned, with citizen science, you have more monitoring points as well. And in these large systems, larger lakes, um, you know, by having more monitoring points as well, that's really valuable because, again, you pick up where in these you know larger systems where the issues are um, and that's one thing that i've seen more locally in windermere as well thank you all everyone for your questions if there are any further questions uh now or never but thank you all for engaging through the chat i see that you've had wonderful conversations happening and sprouting from the chat. So it's really lovely to see. And um, if there are no further questions, I'd like to wish you a wonderful evening or afternoon or morning, wherever you are. Thank you for taking the time to, to listen to us today. It's been lovely to engage with, with you and to share our stories. And yeah, again, thank you. Good evening. <laughs>